Welcome back to the Natural Language Processing course. We're going to continue now with the final section on language modeling, part three. So let's look at some additional uh, issues related to language models. First of all, how do we evaluate the quality of a language model? Well, there are two types of evaluations. The first one is known as an extrinsic evaluation, and that is to use the language model in a specific application, for example, speech recognition or machine translation or uh, part of speech tagging. And the second method is based on an intrinsic evaluation that has to do with the properties of the language model itself. It's much cheaper than an extrinsic evaluation because it can be done automatically. However, it is very important not to use it as a complete substitute for an extrinsic evaluation. At the very least, if you use an intrinsic evaluation, you have to also do some sort of extrinsic evaluation to be able to correlate the two. And once you have a good idea of how the two map to each other, then you can continue using just an intrinsic method. Let's see some of the intrinsic methods first. So the most commonly used method is known as perplexity. So the perplexity is um, given by this formula here. We take the joint probability of all the words in a sentence, take the reciprocal of it, and then take the nth root of that number. That gives us the perplexity. So this is an estimate on how well the model fits the data. A good language model is one that is going to give a high probability to a real sentence. So the perplexity can be thought of as the average branching factor in predicting the next word. Lower perplexity is better because it's correlated with higher probability of the sentence. So in this formula, n is the number of words in the sentence. And let's look at an example now. Suppose that we have a set of words, n equiprobable words, uh, where the probability of each of them is 1 over k. So given the formula for perplexity, we can now compute the value for this specific example. So the value is going to be uh, 1k to the nth power to the power of minus 1 over n, which is the nth root. So the n and the uh, 1 over n are going to cancel, and we're going to get 1 over k to the power of minus 1, which is essentially the original number k. So in that case, what happens is that the perplexity is exactly equal to the number of equiprobable choices that we are making. So if we have, let's say, 10 words to choose from, the perplexity is going to be equal to 10 if those words are equally likely. So this is another way to assert that perplexity is like a branching factor. There's a logarithmic version that can also be used. In that case, we just have a, the base 2 or base 10 logarithm of this previous formula. So we have 2 to the power of minus 1 over n, the sum of the logarithms of the probabilities of the individual words. And this should give us the exact same value as the non-logarithmic version. So the uh, use of perplexity is related to uh, the so-called Shannon game, named after Claude Shannon. Uh, let's see what it looks like. In the Shannon game, you're trying to predict the next word in a sequence based on the words so far. So if you say so like New York governor Andrew Cuomo said, and then you want to predict the next word. Or you can try to predict it yourselves and you'll see that this is not an easy task. You may say, for example, the, that the next word is the. For example, New York governor Andrew Cuomo said the next item on his agenda is such and such. Or it may be some other word. For example, that. New York governor Andrew Cuomo said that on the next day he's going to travel. However, it's very likely that the next word is said or Cuomo or any word that was already used in the sentence. It's also very likely that it's a word that usually doesn't follow the word said. For example, some adjective. So the Shannon game is essentially to predict the next word. So let's try this with a simple example. What's the perplexity of guessing a digit if all the digits are equally likely? Well, as you can imagine from the previous slide, the answer is 10. What about predicting the next letter in a sequence? Well, again, since there are 26 equiprobable choices, the perplexity is equal to 26. Now, this perplexity is going to get lower if we have a better understanding of the words that have already been said before. So for numbers, it's not going to work, but for words, it may make sense. For example, if we have seen that the first letter of the word is T, the probability that the next letter is also T is going to be very small. The probability that the next letter is X is also going to be very small. But the probability of having the next letters as H or E or R or O are going to be larger. So in this case, we don't have any more uh, an equiprobable distribution of letters. We have something that is different. And in that case, the average uh, branching factor is going to be smaller than 26. And this is exactly where perplexity is useful. So here's an example from the Josh Goodman paper that I mentioned earlier. Uh, how about guessing um, 
one of the next words that a customer is going to say over the phone when they call customer service. So let's assume that the probability that they're going to say the word operator is one in four, that they're going to say, say the word sales with a probability of one in four, and that there are 10,000 other cases that add up to a probability of one half. For example, those could be the 10,000 names of people at, who work at the company. So in this case, again, we have to take a weighted sum of those numbers uh, using the harmonic mean, and that is going to give us the average branching factor that corresponds to this particular language model. So how do we measure perplexity across distributions? This is a very important problem in natural language processing because very often the language model is trained on one particular set of data and tested on a completely different set of data. If the two are drawn from the same distribution, the perplexity should be the same on both. However, this is often not the case. Very often people train, for example, part of speech tagger on news stories and then they test it on social media and they are very surprised to see that the performance is pretty low. And this is not surprising because the perplexity can tell us that this is going to happen. It turns out that uh, when the two distributions are very different, the uh, so-called cross entropy uh, between the two distributions is going to be higher. So here's an example. If we were training a language model with uh, the previous uh, slide's data, but however, it turns out that uh, the 10,000 cases are equally likely again, but there are no options for the user to say either a sales or operator. So in that case, the new probability distribution is going to be very different. Instead of having one quarter, one quarter, and then 10,000 values that add up to one half, we're going to have zero, zero, and then 10,000 values that add up to one. So the cross entropy is equal to the log of the perplexity, and it's measured in bits. And this is the formula given two probability distributions. Uh, and as you can see, uh, if the two probability distributions are very different, this cross entropy is going to be very large. And if uh, they're, they're very similar, then it's going to be at its minimum. So some sample values for perplexity from uh, real life natural language data. Uh, they have been computed from the Wall Street Journal in the late 90s uh, on a corpus of 38 million words or 38 million tokens uh, that correspond to 20,000 different words or types. So the perplexity uh, that was uh, computed on a separate sample of 1.5 million documents from the same corpus was 962 for unigrams. Uh, this is at the level of words, not letters. For bigrams, it went down to as low as 170. And then as you would expect with trigrams, it went even lower to 109. So what that means is that even though you can have a total of 20,000 words in your corpus, just by using a unigram model, you're going from 20,000 to less than 1,000 choices on average. And if you're going to trigrams, then you go down by a factor of 200, from 20,000 to 100. So one other metric that is used for evaluating language models is the so-called word error rate. Uh, it is equal to the number of insertions, deletions, and substitutions on, be, uh, between two strings. It's very similar to what we had earlier called the Levenstein eddy distance. And as you remember, this is something that is normalized by sentence length. So here's an example. Suppose that we have one string, Governor Andrew Cuomo had met with the mayor, and another sentence, the governor met the senator. Can you figure out what is the eddy distance between those two strings? I'll give you the answer in a minute. So uh, as you can see, uh, there are three deletions. Uh, we have removed the word Andrew, the word Cuomo, and the word with. We have one insertion, we have added the word the at the beginning, and we have one substitution where we replace the word mayor with the word senator. So that's a pretty large word error rate of five. Even if you normalize it with the sentence length, it will still be a word error rate of, normalized word error rate of one. So now let's consider two issues that come up when we deal with uh, language models. The first one is how to deal with other vocabulary words or OOV words. So those are words that appear in the test data that we have never seen in the training data. Now, for the purposes of uh, estimating their probabilities, we can split the training data into two parts and label all the words in part two that were not in part one as unknown words. So then the estimates for those unknown words will be used as estimates when we deal with the testing data. Another thing that we can do is something called clustering. Uh, we can, for example, combine all of the information that we have about all the date expressions uh, together, uh, all the monetary amounts together separately, all the organizations and all the years. In that case, we can have conditional probabilities that say, 
What's the probability that a certain word wi is going to appear after a year expression? So in this case, all the year expressions combine together to give additional strength to the prediction. So some of the points that, long, uh, that language models don't model very well are named long distance dependencies. So this is where n-gram language models essentially fail by definition because they're only allowed to look at one or two words back. So here's an example. We may be missing some syntactic information. So for example, let's consider the two sentences here. The students who participated in the game are tired. So the word are is conditional on the students. So this is the subject, those are the subject and the verb of the sentence. They're syntactically related. However, there's a total of five words that intervene. So any n-gram model shorter than six grams is going to miss this dependency. So it's not going to make any distinction between this sentence and the next one, which says that the student who participated in the game is tired. So again, we have an instance of agreement that goes back more than five words. So trigram and language models are not going to be able to deal with this information. The same thing applies to missing semantic information. So here are two sentences. The pizza that I had last night was tasty. So tasty in this case modifies pizza and it makes sense because the word tasty is something that you expect a pizza to have as a property. But if I change it to the class that I had last night was interesting, you will see that tasty doesn't fit in this context and yet the trigram model would assign it the same probability in both cases. So because the two words before it are night and was. So the trigram and gram model in this case is going to miss the semantic information because of the long distance between uh, the two words that are semantically related. So there are techniques to deal with this kind of problem. For example, you can use a, a syntactic language model that looks not just at the most recent words, but also at the most recent words that are syntactically related to the current words. So you need to parse the sentence and then figure out that the pizza is related to tasty using a dependency or perhaps some uh, specific syntactic connection. And then you can condition the word tasty on the pizza and similarly condition the word interesting on the word the class. There's some other ideas that you can use. Uh, I just mentioned the syntactic model. So uh, again, the idea is that you want to condition some words on other words that appear in a specific syntactic relation with them. You can also use something called the caching model. And that is to take advantage of the fact that words appear in bursts. So if you see the word Cuomo in a document, it's very likely that the word Cuomo is going to appear again in the same document. So if you keep track of the words that have appeared in the most recent history, you can give them higher probability of appearing in the future. So I'm going to conclude this section by pointing you to several external resources that are relevant to language modeling. The first one is um, the SRI Language Modeling Toolkit, which is available from the SRI website. The second one is the CMU Language Modeling Toolkit, which is available from the CMU website. Both of those are very popular. I think the SI uh, system is more popular these days, and they do more or less the same thing. They allow you to train uh, maximum likelihood estimates uh, from the training data set for any sort of length of n-grams, including as many as 4 and 5 grams. You can also use them to compute perplexity, you can use them to, to label uh, sequences, and you can also uh, use them to estimate um, uh, probabilities using back off and interpolation. I would like also to mention a large corpus of Google n-grams that is available on, on the internet, which has uh, data from uh, billions of documents. And I'm going to show you later some examples of data from that data set. Uh, there's also a possibility to look at the n-grams uh, site uh, proposed by Google, which allows you to track the presence of n-grams uh, historically over hundreds of years. Here's some example Google n-grams. So you can see that they're very large values. Here, all the biograms are conditioned on the word house. And you can see only the first few of those. So for example, the word a uh, appearing after house has a frequency of 302,435 after appears after house 118,000 times and so on. So you can see that those are very large numbers and they can be used to get very reasonable estimates of biogram probabilities that you can use in your systems. So a few more external links uh, here about n-grams. So some of those websites use n-grams to randomly generate text, for example, uh, scientific papers and poems and country band names, and so on. Some of them are really fun. I would encourage you to take a look at those on your own time. So this concludes the section on language modeling.